Good morning. My name is Mark Ventham. I'm one of the pastors at Christchurch Haywards Heath. Welcome to our joint virtual Good Friday service as we gather together from three churches virtually. So from Grace Church, from Cookfield Baptist Church and from Christchurch. Welcome to members from each of those three churches and to others who might attend another church or regularly attend elsewhere but have joined us virtually this morning. Welcome to you as well. We might not be able to physically gather all together as we like to on this day and we're saddened by that but we do still spiritually gather each in our different homes but together united by God's Spirit as we come together to sing and to pray and to hear God's word read and preached and to remember the death of our Lord and Saviour, who the prophet Isaiah says, he took our pain, he bore our suffering, he was a stricken and afflicted by God, he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was on him. The Lord laid on him the iniquity, the sin of us all. This is the one that we remember. This is the one in many ways that we celebrate, the one who died for us. That we might be forgiven, that we might have peace with God, that we might be adopted into the family of God and call God our father. And because he is now our father, we can speak to him in prayer, asking for his help and for his blessing upon us as we gather this morning. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we may not be able to meet as we would want. We recognise that these are extraordinary times, but we are thankful that although we might not be physically together, we can still gather virtually to remember and to celebrate and to delight in our Saviour who died for us. Thank you for our Lord Jesus, who bore our punishment, who took our place, that we might be forgiven, restored to relationship with you, able to call you Father. Thank you for the hope that today brings us. And please, as we sing and as we pray and as we hear your words read and preached, keep us from distraction, encourage and excite us, Teach us afresh of the wonders of the cross, of the power of salvation at work in us. And continue to conform us to become more like Jesus, our Lord and Saviour, who calls us to follow in his footsteps. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, throughout our time together, we'll sing, we'll pray, we'll hear God's word, read and preach. We'll have a short children's talk. And each part will be done by a pastor from one of the three churches and the music will be led by those also from within our three churches. So we're going to sing now, Oh to See the Dawn, reminding ourselves of that first Good Friday over 2,000 years ago of the power of the cross to bring us forgiveness and the great cost that it was for that to be won. And after we've sung, Dan Woodfield from Grace Church will do a short children's talk. So stand, sit and sing together wherever you are. Oh, to see the dawn. darkest day Christ on the road to Calvary tried by sinful men torn and beaten then nailed to a cross of wood this the power of the cross Christ became sin for us took the blame for the wrath we stand forgiven at the cross oh to see the pain written 
risen on your face, bearing the awesome weight of sin. Every bitter thought, every evil deed, crowning your blood-stained brow. This the power of the cross. Christ became sin for us, took the blame for the wrath we stand forgiven at the cross. Now the daylight flees, now the ground beneath Quakes as its maker bows his head Curtain torn in two, dead or raised to life Finish the victory cry There's the power of the cross Christ became sin for us to death, life is mine to live, run through your selfless love, this the power of the cross, Son of God, slain for us, what a love, what a cost we Forgiven at the cross, this the power of the cross, Son of God, slain for us. What a love, what a cost we stand forgiven at the cross. Good morning, everyone. It's Good Friday today. I hope you're having a good morning. Good Friday's a bit of an odd name for today, isn't it? Because you might know we're celebrating the death of Jesus on the cross. You can understand why we might celebrate Easter Sunday, because that's all about new life. But why are we celebrating Good Friday? Why is it good? Well, to help us understand a little bit about why we call it Good Friday. I'm going to read some verses from the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 12 to 14. Listen along to these. But when this priest, talking about Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Did you catch what the writers of the Hebrews said is happening as Jesus goes to the cross? He's offering his life as a sacrifice for sins. In the Bible, a sacrifice just means something dying to deal with sin. Jesus gives his life as a sacrifice to deal with sin. But did you notice, is it just for like one sin or just for a period of time? No, it's for sins for all time to make people perfect. As Jesus dies on the cross in our place, when we trust in him, we are made 
perfect. When God in heaven sees us, he sees us and says, you are perfect. It is just as if you had never sinned because Jesus has paid the full price for every bad thing you have ever done in the past. You are doing now and you will ever do in the future. That's why we call it Good Friday. But it might be that some of us find it really hard to get our head around this idea. So to help us think about this, come with me. Okay, now lots of Christians think that Jesus's death is a little bit like this water bottle. And when we do something bad, we think this is what happens. A little bit of Jesus's sacrifice kind of gets poured away. And Jesus can forgive us for a bit, but what happens if we do something like maybe really bad? Look, it's nearly gone. And then we start thinking, oh, does God still love me? Did Jesus still forgive me? Do I need to fill this up with the things that I do? We end up thinking that Jesus' sacrifice is pretty empty. But do you remember what the writer to the Hebrew said? That's not what Jesus' death is like at all. No, Jesus offered one sacrifice for all time. And so instead of being like a water bottle, Jesus' death can be thought of a little bit more like stepping into a bathtub, which never gets poured away. Look, I can kick and splash and make a mess, but the water's not going anywhere. Jesus' sacrifice is still here. Actually, that's a better picture for what Jesus did on Good Friday. He offered one sacrifice for all time, for all sin that is never going to get poured away. It can never run out. That's really good news because at Easter we remember that there is nothing we can do that exhausts or gets rid of Jesus's sacrifice for us. That's why we call it Good Friday because it's such good news that we can be seen as perfect forever by God because Jesus died to deal with our sin. Well, we're going to sing a song. There is a fountain filled with blood reminding us of Jesus' sacrifice in our place to make us perfect. And then John Hobbs, the minister of Grace Church, is going to lead us in our prayers. So let's stand and sing and pray together. Let's do that together.
by faith I saw the going to pray. Uh, Prayers loosely based on Psalm 22. Let's bow our heads, shall we, as we do that. Psalm 22 begins, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Heavenly Father, we come before you this Good Friday in particular distress and need. We thank you, gracious God, for the cross. We thank you that we can know that you never forsake us because your son experienced our forsakenness so that we could be your children and by his wounds we are healed. But Lord, we cry out to you for our nation and world that is without you, our God, without hope. Lord, you are the enthroned one enthroned in all your holiness, the one who governs all things in righteous majesty and piercing purity, unfathomable wisdom. Throughout the ages, your people have trusted in you and rejoiced to see you answer. And so we pray now with all boldness and pray first for our brothers and sisters throughout the world. Lord, we're seeing Christians scorned and despised like never before. As their faith is mocked this Easter, remind them of how Christ was mocked on the cross. Protect them, Lord, against Easter attacks, from blame in their countries for the coronavirus, from harm within their homes, from unbelieving family members. But Father, where insults and hardships come, grant them a strong trust in you, the grace that Jesus displayed on the cross, and boldness to speak of him and all that he's achieved. May they be able to say that the Lord was never far when trouble was near. And we pray the same for our nation. Father, to see it on its knees and bodies piling up melts our hearts. To see your church often silent, not knowing what to say or how to say it, it grieves us deeply. But Lord, we can thank you for so much already, for placing us in this country with its health service and economic strengths, for the community spirit being fostered, for the spring to offset the darkness. But we cry out to you as well, Lord, do not be far from us. Come quickly and help us. We pray you would deliver us, granting protection and skill to the medics. Restore health to our Prime Minister. Give wisdom to his government and speedy eradication of the virus itself. But above all, Lord, we pray that through this you would awaken our nation to its mortality that people would grasp that they are subject to your providence and so come to fear you. O God, humble Boris Johnson, like you did Nebuchadnezzar, save those who govern so that they would govern in submission to Christ, the risen King of Kings. And Father, through all this, 
we pray you would move your church to a greater appreciation of the gospel. Lord, produce in us perseverance, character and hope. And with that hope, a greater joy in Christ, who has removed the sting of death, a greater readiness to praise him to one another. But we pray too for the creativity and gravity and clarity and boldness and opportunity to speak of Christ to those around us. We pray that especially for church leaders, grant them the profile to do that on a national scale and the faithfulness to do it well. We pray the same for Christian medics, that during this crisis and from this crisis, they would make the most of every opportunity to speak of Christ and him crucified having conversation always full of your grace, seasoned with salt, knowing how to answer everyone. And for those of us who in your faultless purposes get sick and even die, Lord, keep the cross always before us and enable us to be able to say, as the Apostle Paul did, that through people's prayers, we would eagerly expect and hope that we will in no way be ashamed, but have sufficient courage that Christ will be exalted in our bodies, whether by life or by death, for to live is Christ and to die is gain. Heavenly Father, Psalm 22 ends declaring that all the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nations will bow down before him, for dominion belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. O God, we pray that through this crisis you would further this great purpose and goal of all history that our crucified Lord Jesus might receive all honour and praise. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, if you could find a way to a Bible and turn up Mark chapter 15, verses 33 to 41. That's Mark chapter 15, verses 33 to 41. Graham is going to read that to us now. Hi there. Good morning. We're reading from Mark's Gospel in chapter 15 and from verse 21. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by held insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So you are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days? Come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon... Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Lama, Eloi, Eloi, Lama Sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, Listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up to him from Jerusalem were also there. It was preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, 
who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph brought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. So reads God's word. And now we are, we are going to sing together, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Well, good morning. My name is Will Cockrum and I'm the minister of Cookfield Baptist Church. We're going to look at verses 33 to 41 of the passage that Graham uh, just uh, read for us. Uh, before we do that, why don't I lead us in a prayer? 
Father, the Apostle Paul wrote uh, to the Galatians talking about his preaching that before their very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. And so, Father, we pray now that as we come to your word and to hear it preached, we pray that by faith we would see Christ crucified before us. And Father, please help us to respond to him in the right way this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to imagine that you live in Jerusalem uh, around 33 AD. Uh, you're having your one walk a day and you live in the north of Jerusalem and you go out to the north and just uh, to the west along a footpath. It's a familiar footpath to you in lots of ways. And there's one bit that you don't like walking past because about once a week you walk past a place called Golgotha, the place of the skull. It's notorious because it's the place where the Romans crucify those who have rejected and rebelled uh, against uh, the Roman state. And you walk past, you walk by, and you ask someone, well, what's going on? And they look up and suddenly you realise that the person in the middle of the three people being crucified is Jesus of Nazareth. You've heard about him, maybe you were one of the people who was putting the palm uh, trees, the palm leaves are, are on, the, on the road into Jerusalem just a week ago. You've heard some of the things he's done and some of the things he's said. And you find yourself asking the question, what's going on? And by now it's about five minutes to twelve and you're standing there and you're watching the events as the Roman soldiers uh, surround him, as the, the chief priests and the others uh, stand around mocking him. And then suddenly, the sky goes black. And darkness descends over the land. And again you find yourself thinking and saying, what's going on? And people still ask that question today, don't they? What's going on at the cross? Some people will say, well, did, did all the events that we've just been reading about, did they really happen? Some will say, well, this is, just, this is just weird. And people want to shy away, understandably on one level, from the incredible suffering that we read about in Mark's Gospel. They can ignore it. They might just think it's ridiculous. Many then and now think the idea of God, the Son of God, dying on a cross is ridiculous. Who would worship a God who died is the argument. Many think it's ridiculous because you think, well, why would God allow that to happen? You might be one of those and maybe... Uh, your friends might be, you, you might say, well, the cross seems important, but I just don't get it. I don't understand why Christians make such a big deal of Good Friday. After all, the events are horrific. Perhaps you'll hear many people who say, well, Jesus did it just to set a good example. And then you find yourself thinking, well, surely that's a, it's pretty pointless, isn't it? Did he really have to go to that level of suffering to set a good example? Is that really it? What's going on at the cross? Well, Mark, in his account, in his eyewitness account, tells us, I think, what's going on. I think you can talk about it in two different ways. Two things here. The first is that there's the what and there's the who. The what and the who. Firstly, the what. What happened? What was happening? Well, according to Mark, judgment. Look at verse 33 with me. Do you have a Bible open if you haven't got one in front of you already? At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. You see, there were three hours of supernatural darkness. And it was supernatural. This isn't a, a, an eclipse of some kind. Eclipses don't last for three hours. And of course, this is an eyewitness account that can be trusted. You can see in verses 40 and 41 who the eyewitnesses were. 
the women who were there to witness uh, the, the death of Jesus, the burial of Jesus, and indeed the resurrection of Jesus. Unusually, uh, they are recorded as women. Women's uh, testimony was not permissible in a Roman court. And yet, of course, this reminds us that this really happened. This is eyewitness testimony. You wouldn't have recorded it being women unless it actually was. No, this is supernatural darkness. And this is a huge Old Testament theme, actually. Think back to Exodus, Exodus chapters 10 and to 12. God is saving his people out of Egypt by judging the Egyptians. And you've had the different plagues. And then the plague of darkness comes down on the land of Egypt. What does that signify? That judgment is being done and judgment is coming. Judgment comes over the land before the Passover, where the, the lamb is slain and the blood is put over the doorpost to, 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 to turn aside God's wrath as the angel of the Lord comes through at the land of Egypt. A sacrifice is made to save God's people from God's wrath as God judges. And so when you read in the Bible of supernatural judgment, supernatural darkness, we are to think God is judging. And this actually is a big Bible truth. You see, the Bible says that the Bible says that God made us. He made everyone and everything. He is the creator of each one of us, you and me. And the Bible says that we have rebelled against our creator. Like traitors betraying and rising up against a king, we have risen up from the dust and shaken our fists at God. We have rebelled against him. We have said, I can live, I want to live my life my own way. I want to make my own rules. I want to decide what I think of Jesus for myself. And we reject him. And the Bible says that we, that we therefore are not naturally good. We are kind of born sinful. We are sinners by nature and by choice. And because God is good, well, he must punish us for our rebellion. He must judge. Now, we like that idea when it comes to others, particularly when others have done heinous things. We like the idea that no one gets away with it. But, of course, the problem is that if God will judge others, then he will rightly judge us. There are some Christians who are going around at the moment saying that uh, COVID-19 is God's explicit judgment against us as a nation. That question is way above our pay grade. But it is true to say that COVID-19 is reminding us and reminding our world that we live in a world that is under judgment, that is awaiting judgment. Whereas it were in the waiting room of the courtroom, ready to go in, And things like plagues and viruses remind us that all is not well between us and God. And of course, what is the sentence as we are pronounced guilty? Well, the Bible is clear. Jesus himself is clear that the sentence is death and hell. What is hell? Well, hell is the active, eternal wrath of God against sin. It is the absence of God to bless. God isn't absent from hell. He is absent in terms of his blessing, but he is present in terms of his judgment. The language of the Bible is is that of of fire. I suspect that's probably uh, pictorial language of something that's much worse. And of course, it says something, doesn't it, of the seriousness of sin. Sinning against God is an an infinite thing. Sinning against the the creator of the world is a, well, it's an infinite crime. And so is the punishment. It is eternal. And left to ourselves, the Bible says, we have no hope of escaping that. We are guilty as charged and we cannot do anything about it. Even the good things that we do are so tainted with sinful motives. 
God can't be bought off. He's too good. But the darkness here that descends over Golgotha, just outside Jerusalem, points to the fact that God is judging some sin before that great day when Jesus will return to judge the living and the dead. You see that too with the cry of Jesus, verse 34. At three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's a quote, as John read earlier, from Psalm 22. A psalm which, where King David speaks as God's king who feels forsaken by God in his suffering. And that idea of being forsaken ultimately is a, is a picture of hell. Of being rejected by God, forsaken, separated by God and his blessing. Where God is, as I said, only present to punish and with all the suffering that comes with that. And you see this theme of, temp of, of, of judgment too with the temple. So when Jesus dies mid-afternoon, three o'clock-ish, verse 38, the, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The temple uh, in Jerusalem, Herod's temple, uh, was a place where sin was said to be paid for. The sacrifices were said to turn aside God's wrath as the blood was presented on the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies. The blood was said to turn aside God's wrath at our sin, like the Passover lamb uh, in the Exodus. But it was only a picture, ultimately, of what was needed. You see, the, the blood of, of, of goats and lambs and bulls couldn't take away sin. They couldn't actually save us couldn't save the Jews from hell. You see, what we need, actually, is someone who is both God and human to atone for our sin, to be judged, to, be, to die in our place, to be punished, to experience the wrath of God in our sin in our place. That is our only hope. Otherwise, it is hell forever. And therefore, to understand what is going on at the cross, we not only need to understand, as it were, what is happening, that is, judgment. We need to understand, secondly, who it is happening to. Look again at verse 34 with me. At three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That points us to a big truth about Jesus. Who is he? Well, he's a man. He is truly human. He doesn't even just have a human body. He had a human mind. He was fully human. He was born as a baby. He grew up. He lived and he died as a man. And Jesus, as a man here, soaked as he is with the Old Testament, soaked as he is, as he was in the Psalms, he cries out the, using the appropriate language for someone who is being abandoned, who feels like he is being abandoned by God himself. He, his mind, as he meditates on the Bible, his mind goes to Psalm 22. But is he being judged for his own rebellion? That was the view of many who would have been around the cross as people stand next to you looking at the cross. He's there because, well, because of what he said about the temple or the Pharisees or whatever. Maybe even God himself, he was accused as a blasphemer. Well, have a look at verse 35 with me. When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, He's calling Elijah. Now why do they say that? Well, on one level, it's probably because Eli, Eli might sound a bit like Elijah. But in Jewish tradition, there was this idea that Elijah, who famously went up to 
uh, heaven uh, in a chariot of fire, might come and r rescue a righteous man who was suffering unjustly. And so the people around see the supernatural darkness and they think, well, maybe Elijah's coming. They offer him, therefore, something to drink to keep him going. And verse 36, let's leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down. Let's see if he really is righteous. Let's really see if he deserves judgment. But of course, the Bible's answer is that Jesus was righteous. He is righteous. He lived a perfect life. He was the perfect human. He was the perfect person that we should have been. He always loved God with all his mind, soul, heart and strength. He would have been the best of friends. He lived the life that we should have lived. And so the Bible says he is able to offer himself up as a sacrifice, as a fulfillment of the temple sacrifices in our place. To take the judgment that we deserve. You see, what was going on at the cross? While well, this perfect man, Jesus, was being judged for sin, but not the sin that he himself had committed. He had committed no sin. No, he was doing it not for his own sin. He was being judged for the sin of all whom God would save. You see, ultimately the Bible says that sin is only ever judged in one or two places. The first is, as we've already thought, in hell. When Jesus returns, everything that has been done in public and in private will be revealed and punishment uh, will be given out eternally to perhaps most people who've ever lived. But the Bible says there is a now another place where sin has been judged, where the, the, the wrath of God has been poured out. And that is as Jesus was crucified and hung dying under the darkness on that hill outside Jerusalem almost 2,000 years ago. You see, what was going on for his people? Well, as it were, he was, he was swapping places with us. He was punished as a substitute, like the lamb was killed in the place of the people. So Jesus was sacrificed as the Passover lamb, using those words uh, that uh, Mark read for us at the beginning. He was pierced for our transgressions. He took our place. And so the wrath of God, as it were, Jesus took him, our sin upon himself and the wrath of God was poured out on him. God's wrath therefore was turned away from us and onto him. But it was a swap. He took the punishment we deserve as a substitute in our place. And he gives us his perfect life, his righteousness, as the one who suffered unjustly for the unjust, to make us just, righteous before God by status. His perfect life is credited to our account. But who's the hour? Who did Jesus die for? Well, again, from our passage, it is for all those who will confess and live as if Jesus is the Son of God. You see, who gets there first? Who, who twigs this first? Well, it is the most unlikely of people. <laughs> who is it? It's the centurion. Centurions uh, were uh, the leaders of uh, large groups of uh, Roman soldiers. They were battle-hardened killers. You know, if you bumped into a centurion uh, in Jerusalem, you were scared. He had power, he had influence, 
and he had a lot of blood on his hands. Jesus, uh, the centurion would likely have been with Jesus for the day. The centurion might have seen the sham trial where Jesus was shown to be innocent and yet declared to be guilty. He would have probably been there when Jesus was flogged and led outside the city gate. He would have overseen the crucifixion and watched him suffer as the darkness descended. He would have seen, now he sees, the way that Jesus gives up his life. It was likely, it was usual for uh, people to be on, on a cross for, for days before they died. You died of exhaustion. But yet here Jesus, within hours, gives up his life, showing that he is in control. Look at verse 37. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. So verse 39. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus, imagine him stood at the foot of a cross looking up, and he saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. Jesus is a man. He was a man. But is he just a man? No. He is the Son of God. He is the second person of the eternal Trinity. He is the creator of the world. He is the one through whom and for whom all things were created, including you and me. Jesus owns us. He is our creator. He is the son in human flesh. And so as the centurion watches the person of the son die according to his human nature, the centurion who would, who would have only ever called Caesar and dared to call Caesar the son of God confesses that surely this man is the son of God. The centurion likely spoke more than he knew. But for 2,000 years Christians have confessed with him that we believe in Jesus Christ, God's only son, our Lord who died, who was judged for us. What's going on at the cross? One on one level, there are great mysteries here. It's not that the, the, the Trinity is being ripped apart, but the Son of God is being judged for us. What love? What love. And so on this Good Friday, what is your response? As it, as it were, you, by faith, you, you see Jesus crucified. What is your response? Is it to mock him and reject him? Perhaps you don't like Jesus' diagnosis of your heart. Perhaps you feel actually, that you just want to ignore Jesus. You'd rather not think about him. Well, the Bible says that to reject Jesus is, as it were, to actively choose hell. In a way that a, a, a man who is drowning out at sea uh, dies because he rejects the hand of the, that comes down from the lifeboat. To reject Jesus, the saviour, that we need is to choose to be judged on the last day when Jesus returns. That is tragic. It is folly. And so if you're not yet a Christian and you're uh, watching in this morning, turn and confess that Jesus is the Son of God and live as if he is. Turn from your sin, turn from your rebellion and receive the forgiveness that he offers Realise that Jesus took your sin on himself on the cross in his great love so that you could be saved. If you will turn and trust him this morning, he assures you that you can and will be saved. 
We aren't saved as Christians by, by cleaning ourselves up. We can't save ourselves. No, we're drowning. But the Saviour, the lifeboat, as it were, has come and has reached down and offers us this morning the hand of salvation. Turn and worship Jesus, the Son of God. And as we close, if you're a Christian this morning, as I suspect most of us are, what is your response to Jesus? What should be our response to Jesus as by faith we see him crucified? Well, surely it's to worship him. The son of God who was judged for us, for you, for me. Perhaps this morning you feel unloved. Whether it be because of the way other people are treating you or because you feel isolated. Well, we can remember again, can't we? God's love for us. The father sent his son for us to die. The Son chose willingly out of great love for us to go to the cross to be the Saviour that we need. And the Spirit lives in us, helping us to understand, helping us to follow, helping us to love the Saviour that we need and have. And so whatever else is going on today, remember that God loves you in our fears, in our doubts, in our worries. We can, all of us, remember, can't we? And rejoice and worship the Son of God who was judged for us. Let's take a moment of quiet to pray and then I'll lead us in a prayer. Father, we thank you uh, for the diagnosis of our own hearts that we deserve your judgment. We thank you that in your kindness you tell us the truth. As it were, you tell us that we are drowning and that we have no hope left to ourselves. But Father, we thank you for providing us with the rescuer we need. We thank you, Father, for Jesus, the God-man, who on the cross 2,000 years ago died and was judged for our sin. Lord Jesus, we worship you by faith this morning. We thank you uh, for the empty cross and now the empty tomb. We thank you for your victory on the cross. And so, Father, we pray that you would help us to respond to Jesus rightly this morning in repentance, in faith, in trust. Father, whatever our circumstances, whatever the fears, the worries, the anxieties of our own hearts this morning, we pray that you would help us to trust, to worship and so to live for the Lord Jesus. And we pray, Father, this morning that many others in our area and around our nation would come for the first time to bow the knee to the Lord Jesus, to confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and so to turn to him in repentance and faith. Please, Father, do more than we could possibly ask or imagine. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're now going to sing Man of Sorrows.
Well, thank you for watching. Uh, if you're not connected with one of our churches uh, and you'd like to know more, please do get in touch uh, with uh, the church whose channel you're watching this on. Uh, get, get in touch with a Christian maybe who you know um, if you do. We'd love to be able to explain more and help you to follow Jesus um, for yourself. Let's close our time together by praying the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.